Please take your seat so we can get started. Please take your seats. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Welcome to AHI 2022. How about a round of applause for AHI? All right, here we go. First and foremost, first and foremost, I'd like to offer a welcome on behalf of the AHI Board of Directors and our staff, and a thank you to all of you for making the arduous journey all the way to Henderson, Nevada, this afternoon, this morning, this afternoon, and of course, tomorrow as well. My name is Victor Sainz. I, I have the privilege of serving as your board chair this past year. <laughs> Alongside a, an amazing group of other colleagues, friends, and leaders in, in, in the higher education landscape on the board of directors. We're gonna hear from uh, many, many individuals throughout our two days together. Um, and uh, you know, as we consider the time that we have spent apart, it has been two years almost to the day that we last convened. In the early, early days pre-pandemic, some of y'all were there in Irvine, California two years ago when we were literally bumping elbows and learning about social distancing and not really fully grasping the gravity of the moment and for that matter, the many, many moments and days and months since. All of us, I think, have been impacted, certainly, but in many cases, even devastated, traumatized, disrupted and disruptions in our lives. And I think all of us have lost loved ones as well. So in their honor, I'd ask all of us to, in a moment of reflection and silence, honor the memories of those that we have lost and those that continue to suffer. Thank you. So this morning, we have a uh, collection of about 180 or so individuals, all of you here present today in person. Once again, we thank you for making the journey here to be with us. We also have about 70 or so that have signed up to join us virtually. So the first time ever, AHI is being hosted at an institution, because we've always been in hotels, but more importantly, a very, very fine institution. And we're so pleased that they uh, opened their doors to us in Nevada State College. We're gonna learn and hear all about Nevada State College throughout the morning. And for the first time ever, we're also hosting a hybrid conference. Uh, and I'm hoping that the folks in Zoom right now, looking right at the camera now, are, uh, are following along. I understand that they are excellent. So we're trying a lot of new things today. And with that, of course, comes the, uh, the opportunity to learn and to, uh, to uh, ask for grace. So I think all of us have learned over the last two years that that's more important now than ever to, to show each other grace and respect and dignity. And, and with that in mind, be prepared for a few little you know, hang ups here and there throughout the two days, but we're gonna work it out. We're gonna work it out. We're, we got a great team and, uh, and we're here to try to make the most of this uh, amazing experience and this opportunity, this really blessed opportunity to be together again, recognizing that all of you are away from your families and from your work to make the most of this time and to showcase some really outstanding Latinx leaders, scholars, educators throughout the next two days. So we are going to be uh, welcomed uh, shortly by uh, President Darion Pollard, who is uh, the president of this uh, illustrious institution, uh, Nevada State College. Uh, I do want to just briefly acknowledge that uh, the vice president for community and student engagement is here with us today, also a member of our board, Dr. Adit Fernandez. Adit, would you stand up, please? I know the, the Zoom the camera can't rotate, so she's there. I promise she's here. But more importantly, she's been here for AHI uh, for many months in planning uh, alongside a, a really amazing group of, uh, of uh, NSC staff and, of course, our own staff with AMC. 
And I'll get a chance to acknowledge and honor them uh, in a little while, but I just wanted to say thank you. And there's gonna be a lot of thank yous to go throughout the, the rest of the time we're here together. Okay, so let's see if this works. Where's Dr. Pon Juan? What's happened, man? This is broken. There we are. <laughs> All right, here we are. Uh, we'll skip right through. Well, you already know who I'm. All right, we'll skip right through them. So we're going to start with a land acknowledgement here in Nevada State College in the great state of Nevada. And, and with that, we are very pleased to be able to share this outstanding video produced by the tribal communities of Southern Nevada. Hi, I'm Kat Furman, member of the Nevada State College Native American and Indigenous Peoples Coalition. Thank you for joining me in this land acknowledgement statement. We Scorpions honor and celebrate the land and resources we're using to sustain ourselves. We're upon the sacred ancestral land of the Nuwu Southern Paiute, Washoe, Numu Northern Paiute, Nue Hualapai, and Shemahuevi people who live and thrive all around the state of Nevada. We also highlight and uplift all of Nevada's 27 sovereign tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and settler colonialism that continues to impact the native and indigenous communities today. And we honor the past, present, and future stewards of this land. Land acknowledgements represent only a small part of the efforts toward systemic equity and inclusion for Native Indigenous people in Nevada. The Nevada System of Higher Education now offers a fee waiver for qualifying Native American students. I encourage you to visit nsc.edu forward slash land acknowledgement where you can learn more about Native Nations in Nevada, read about the land on which you stand, connect with our institution's contact for the fee waiver, and find out how to join the Native and Indigenous Peoples Coalition, a committee of the NSC Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. Thank you. And in the words of my Native ancestors, donada go ha'i, until we meet again. Thank you to our hosts here at Nevada State College for providing that, uh, that wonderful video to, to help showcase and to really honor this ancestral land that we are convening in today. And you know, if I may borrow just a, a brief point from this video um, about sovereignty and about oppression, you know, around the world today, we know in this very moment, there are peoples whether it's across the continent of Africa or in the Ukraine, that whose sovereignty is also being threatened, often in a perpetual sense for other communities across the globe. So it's important that we also acknowledge the reality of the moment that we're all in, recognizing that people around the wor world and our shared humanity are also struggling and suffering at this point. Okay, so I'm gonna walk through a few, and again, this is, we'll figure it out, thank you, Lily. All right, we're gonna walk through uh, some logistics and housekeeping things as we start. I want you to please take out your phones if you, I know you all have them, take out your phones and hopefully you can zoom in close enough to scan that QR code because if you haven't already done so, uh, you should have already gotten it through your email, but certainly um, if you haven't done so, you can download the, uh, the program this way. We are going paperless as much as we can anyway through this conference. Um, and uh, we also have been sending out daily reminders. We'll send out uh, a bunch more throughout the day today as we highlight different uh, aspects of uh, our time together. And some of you, I think there's over 90 now, have joined the uh, GroupMe group for, for those of you who, are, who prefer that form of communication as the way to stay connected. Uh, we don't have a conference app at this time we, for, for this year's conference. Um, we, you know, it was a sort of small enough convening for us to, to utilize other means. And so uh, the group me is one approach, obviously emails, and you can also download the QR code, but this is a great way to be able to track the day 
We're going to be in three buildings uh, throughout the, the two days together. Here is a building B on your map, if uh, you've downloaded the map already. Yes. Um, and uh, we're also going to be in the education school, which is literally right behind us, that direction, and also the student center, okay. uh, which is, uh, what's the official name for it? The Rogers Student Center, which is that way. So behind us, we kind of have a little triangle here of sorts for the three buildings that we're primarily going to be uh, connecting and, and meeting in. And this is going to be kind of home base. All right. So think about this space here, this auditorium uh, as a home base. We're going to have all of our key sessions here, our keynote speakers, and, uh, and of course, our awards a little later this morning. So we're really excited about that. We're also streaming live, as we said, through Zoom. And so, you know, we have about how many now do we have, Kayla, on Zoom? 31. 31 people. Okay, we'll get more folks coming in throughout the day, I'm sure. And then finally, we are uh, fully on social media. We've been working with our social media team the last few weeks and months in preparation. And uh, we encourage you to use this hashtag, hashtag AHI22, uh, for our time together over the next two days as a way to share with the rest of the world and the rest of our communities all the great things that are going to be happening here over the next few days. All right, so I'm going to go through a series of slides, and this happens at every kind of conference like this, but, you know, it's important that we, uh, we do this because we have so many great partners that we are uh, connected to as part of this conference and really as part of the association of AHI and our membership. And first and foremost with ETS, ETS has been a longtime partner, partner with AHI, in sponsoring not only our Tamari Vera lecture, but our outstanding dissertation awards, and really helping be a, a thought partner to us in a whole host of other ways that we, as we continue to program and advance our common cause in, in, in education for the Latinx community. The Hispanic Outlook in Higher Education and Sage Publishing continue to be very key uh, um, journal outlets and partnerships for us. Um, as well as Latinos in, in higher, higher ed.com. Both the, all three of these partners represent key strategic uh, partnerships that we've had for many, many years to provide us a variety of different outlets to be able to disseminate our work, um, both the conference proceedings, the scholarly papers that we, uh, that we showcase, and then ultimately as well, even the voices of our graduate faculty fellows uh, through, through Hispanic Outlook. And then finally, another strategic partner is the University of Utah. The University of Utah's Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion uh, we've been partnering with them the last two years now as part of the New Leaders Academy, NLA. We've been so fortunate to have started this partnership with NLA many, many years ago as part of this pipeline of legacy programs and cultivating and training Latinx leadership and scholarly excellence from graduate school for, to early career faculty and now into leadership roles. Uh, the NLA fellows, some of them are here today, we'll acknowledge them a little later, but, but nonetheless, we are so proud of this partnership. NLA is now being hosted at the University of Utah. So with, the, uh, with ETS, as I mentioned, there, there's various different ways that they support and they uh, partner with us. One of them happened yesterday as we kicked off our conference. And I want to take this opportunity to thank and, and appreciate Dr. Luis Bonfant Juan for chairing the Latinx ETS Student Success Institute, which happened yesterday afternoon here in this very room. Luis, would you stand up to be recognized, sir? He was also uh, joined, uh, co-chaired uh, the session by Dr. Adit Fernandez, who we already met. Thank you, Adit. And every year at this pre-conference institute, we feature um, a, a recent faculty fellow. And this year's uh, faculty fellow that we featured as our keynote speaker was Dr. Marisa Vasquez. Is Marisa here? Well, we'll clap for her anyway. <laughs> so, all right. Later on this morning, we're going to hear from Professor Norma Cantu, who will deliver the 38th Tomati Vera Lecture. Norma is here with us this morning. Thank you very much, Norma. She's my dear faculty colleague at UT Austin, also professor at the School of Law there, and currently chair of the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights, appointed by President Biden. So we're, we're really privileged to, be, uh, to have her here with us this morning. And then, of course, ETS, our, our key sponsor in recognizing scholarly excellence through the outstanding dissertation competition. Uh, we've, this has been really one of the highlights of this conference every year. This competition 
uh, allows us to really recognize and, and acknowledge greatness among us as we continue to help nurture this next generation of scholars for our communities. And, and so this year is no different in recognizing um, one, the winner of the competition, but also two outstanding second and third place winners as well. So we'll bring them up here shortly. All right, so as I said earlier, there's a few other uh, sort of logistic things that we got to get to, but important ones nonetheless. We this year are blessed to have quite an array of sponsors as part of this conference. Uh, BOK Financial in particular, so our, our, even our friends in Oklahoma, those of us who live in Texas, we can get along okay. Uh, <laughs> And in fact, BOK is a, a very, very key sponsor. Is, uh, is uh, Jose here with BOK? There he is. How you doing, sir? Appreciate you being here, sir, representing BOK Financial. We also have uh, support from the ECMC Foundation. Anyone here from ECMC Foundation at the end, I know they're going to be here a little later. Okay. Uh, President William Serata at El Paso Community College, a former awardee of ours, um, also uh, we're very, very pleased to have uh, EPCC. Anyone from the El Paso area? I know we have El Paso people. All right. Excellent. Thank you. We have Mount SAC at se celebrating their 75th years as well, also at the Ambar level. Thank you very much to Mount SAC. Texas, we have Mount SAC folks here, by the way, before I move on. All right. Texas State University as well as it, is it Ambar sponsor, Texas State University. Are they here? Anybody from Texas State here? All right, thank you. Of course, our, our partners down the street in, uh, in Las Vegas at UNLV as well. We were very, very proud to, to partner them with, with them this year as an AMBAR sponsor, but also uh, to, to, they loan us out laptops. So hey, it, it, all, it all counts. We'll take all the help we can get, you know? <laughs> very, very appreciative to Jose Luis. And of course, my, my institution, my alma mater, the University of Texas. I know we have a few UT Austin people in the house. Where are my horns at? All right. All right. Excellent. All right. Enough with uh, throwing the horns. All right. Never enough, y'all. All right. All right. Let me also run through our, some of our Jade sponsors, Cal State Monterey Bay. All right. Cal State Monterey Bay. The, uh, the College of Education at UNLV. So not just the institution, but also the College of Ed. Um, also, to the Onyx sponsors here, we have Cal State Long Beach, TCU College of Ed, the Trellis Foundation, which is based in Texas, uh, and the College of Professional Ed at Texas Women's University. Once again, thank you all for your support. <laughs> then lastly, our Turquesa, Coral, and, and NACAD sponsors, uh, Cal State Bakersfield, The Ohio State University. Did I say it right? I think I did. All right, all right. I know we got Ohio State folks. The University of Georgia. Uh, UT San Antonio, Familia Martinez Lopez. Muchas gracias, Carmen, la doctora. Uh, Felician University as well at the, at the NACAR level. So thank you all very, very much to all of our sponsors to make this conference possible. All right, we're, we're going to... Uh, these are also sponsors. That, we also have sponsors of our various different events throughout the, uh, the two days together. Many of these you've already seen, but I, you know, a couple more that I wanna make sure we acknowledge here. Uh, Dr. Edna Acosta Villan, one of our board members is also sponsoring our, our Cigarroa family lecture. Uh, we also have uh, University of Kentucky College of Ed who's also sponsoring the Cigarroa family lecture. Uh, Dean Julian Vasquez Heilig who's a member of our board is leading that charge. And of course the, the lecture itself is um, endowed after the Cigarroa family uh, from Laredo, Texas. So if anybody knows uh, Francisco Cigarroa, who's most recently was the chancellor of the UT University of Texas system, is a, 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 a neuro, uh, a doctor of neuroscience in, in, at UT San Antonio, well, at Medical Center in San Antonio now. But his family endowed the lecture and we were very, very honored to be able to partner with that lecture. And in fact, we're gonna host our, our second keynote this morning by Dr. Jessica Esquivel, who uh, is here. Everybody around and applause for Dr. Esquivel. We'll hear all about uh, more from, do, from Dr. about Dr. Esquivel a little later in the morning. All right, and the event sponsors for our award ceremony was also happening actually around noon today. Uh, just a few other uh, sponsors, some of these logos you already recognize, but I just wanted also to acknowledge uh, our very own uh, recent chair and immediate past chair of AHIV, Dr. Patricia Redondo who is a, a, the Arredondo Advisory Group, is one of our sponsors for the award ceremony as well. All right, 
So this is Dr. Darian Pollard. She's our president for Nevada State College and our host this morning. Uh, we're waiting for her arrival, president schedules being what they are. So as soon as we, we have that opportunity, we will return to, to properly acknowledge and, and give Dr. Pollard the opportunity to speak and welcome us. Okay, so our board of directors. So I've referenced a few already, uh, but I, I did want to just formally acknowledge and, and at this point, as you see all their beautiful faces up there and their names, I, I'd like all the board directors to please stand to be recognized. At this time. We have uh, worked hard over the last few years to really remake the organization for, for all of you, for all of us, right? This is a membership organization and, and, our, and our governing body should reflect our membership as broadly and accurately as possible. And we work very, very hard under the leadership of Dr. Redondo over the last two years and continuing this year and going to next year with our chair elect, Dr. Patrick Valdez, to make, ensure that we are responsive, representative, and leading the charge with respect to what our membership cares about and how they want to continue to champion the work of AHIG going forward. Truly, it's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to serve among this distinguished group of colleagues over the last few years, to learn from each other, to you know, argue every now and then, uh, but really all with this common cause, to forge the mission of AHI forward and to carry the legacy of our fine organization forward. Uh, this legacy was built almost 40 years ago uh, he has been around almost 40 years in one form or another, 17 as an incorporated 501c3, but 40 years of legacy building, of leadership, right, of cultivating and acknowledging scholarly excellence. This is a great legacy for this organization, one that is worth not only preserving, but growing. And so much of what we're going to hear about, you're going to hear about over the next two days from various different board members will clue you in a little bit more about the amazing things that are happening and that are happening with you alongside all of us uh, as a, what a true membership association like this should be. One that continues to lead the charge. There's no other organization like AHI in this country right, that showcases the talent within our communities that is committed to helping to nurture the future of Latinx scholarship, of scholarly excellence, of emerging scholars, of senior scholars and leaders that's what we exist for, to do that, to showcase our community and to help usher in that next generation of leaders and scholars for higher education. All of us work at institutions. Thank you. All of us work at institutions that have some varying degree of challenge with respect to representation, you know, having the, either Latinx or other communities of color represented in leadership ranks. Um, or for that matter, any longstanding commitment, right? We, we recognize there's 538 or what is it still? Something like that, HSIs now, and more every day, it seems like. And I know many of you in this room and throughout the next two days will showcase research on this, you know, sort of the evolving environment around our HSIs across the country. But again, a commitment to serving, serving us as, as our colleague, Dr. Gina Garcia and others would attest to means there has to be authenticity and a sincere commitment over the long haul to uh, not only the Latinx community, but all the various communities of colors that we serve, that our institutions serve. And all of that is also manifested in the future of AHI as we embark on a new set of initiatives, new programs, growing on the legacy programs of our fellows, et cetera, right? including potentially the, the opportunity to, to revisit the name of the organization, to better reflect present and future identities and states of being for our community. I wasn't looking for an applause, but all, right. <laughs> all that to say, there's some really exciting things in store. I'm not gonna give it, away, give it all away because my colleagues, Dr. Arredondo and Dr. Valdez will speak about this more over the next two days, but just to plant a few seeds about what's coming, but there, because there is a lot of exciting things that are coming. And these are the people helping to lead the charge, including, by the way, our very first two elected board members, elected by the membership, Dr. Gla Claudia Garcia Lewis. Thanks, Claudia. And, and Dr. Monique, soon to be Dr. Monique Posadas. Where's Monique? I gave you the title, though, right? All right, give you a little more motivation to finish. All right. 
Monique is actually, uh, well, she's a full-time staff member, uh, helps to run trio programs at uh, Cal State Fullerton, and also is a doctoral student at Claremont. So she's actually our, your graduate student rep on the board. First time we've ever had that. So thank you, Monique, for your service and to all of our board members for their outstanding service. All right, so we also have, it says out here outgoing, but we were able to finagle them and <clears throat> encourage them to return. So I wanna just acknowledge that we do have three really outstanding leaders, uh, some of whom we've already acknowledged. Uh, actually, I've already mentioned all three, but all of them are returning back. They will be renewing their board term for another three years. And honestly, all of us are the beneficiaries, quite frankly, of their return. Their leadership has been instrumental in this change over the last two years. So much has happened, so many positive things. Uh, growth things have happened for this organization on their watch. So once again, let's acknowledge Patricia, Carmen, and Edith for, for their leadership and their commitment to return. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I said there was going to be a lot of thank yous and acknowledgements. That's just what we do at the opening plenary. So again, thank you for indulging us. Again, none of this is possible. None of this, the last day and the last next two days, without some amazing team of folks that are not only behind the scenes, but are literally uh, to my side here as well. I wanna acknowledge that in the last two years, the last year and a half, he has become uh, much more organized and professionalized as an association, directly as a result of our partnership with AMC. Um, AMC is our, they're our operationals and executive administrative partners uh, led by Dr. Lucia Gutierrez, who's our executive director. I think by now all of you have probably gotten at least one email from Lucia, right? If not more than one. But, but Dr. Gutierrez has been our executive director. She couldn't be with us uh, at the conference in person. I know she's on Zoom right now, uh, Lucia. So I just want to give you a shout out and acknowledge you for all that you continue to do for our, our organization. And uh, she promises she will be here next year, uh, wherever it is we convene. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, thank you, Lucia. And I want to also acknowledge uh, several other members of the AMC team that have been, again, instrumental in, in, as we continue to help organize and professionalize what we do as an association. Samantha Davis is our finance person. Kayla Reed. Kayla, who's about to graduate from Oklahoma State, by the way, has been uh, our coordinator for memberships. You probably heard from her as well. And then Eva Braccioli, did I say that right, Eva Braccioli? All right, is our social media uh, guru, and she's been excellent in helping us to really push out uh, our, our social media messaging over the last few weeks and months, and including throughout the conference. So if you tweet out with the hashtag ahi 2022 I'm sorry, ahi 22 or 2022 um, she'll work to retweet and, and continue to amplify all the great things that are happening here. I also want to acknowledge other partners that are here with us as part of the event program, the event coordination, including uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, Veronica Allen. Is Veronica here or is she still at the registration desk? She's outside. Okay, well, we'll get an opportunity to acknowledge her later on. We also have Ms. Lily Piper here who's running the board for us. Thank you, Lily. And, and Leslie Isor Isorski, did I say that right? Leslie, all right, thank you all. It's a team effort on the part of AMC to help support uh, this uh, conference and to make it you know, happen in, in this way. So we're so appreciative of their ongoing support. Okay, I'm gonna turn our attention now and invite uh, my colleague and board member, uh, Dr. Asada to join me up here. And uh, she's going to, I'm gonna hand the podium over to her to offer some words and a tribute uh, to Lenore Green. Buenos dias a todos, a todos, todos. <laughs> um, it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's an honor to stand before you today um, in honoring and celebrating uh, our beloved Lenora Green to celebrate her life and her legacy. Um, as many of you know, she passed away on February 10th of this year. And many of us who knew her are, were devastated by, by her, the news of her passing. So today we kick off this wonderful conference and we pay tribute to Lenora. <clears throat> uh, she spent uh, 37 years at ETS where she was the founding executive in creating the ETS Center for Advocacy and Philanthropy. And one of her initiatives she, that she was you know, really passionate about is the outstanding dissertation competition. And we heard Victor say a few words about that uh, just a few minutes ago. 
This is one of the uh, hallmarks, you want to say, one of the most important sort of initiatives between ETS and AHI. And as you know, and you will hear more about this dur during the day today and tomorrow, it spotlights the top doctoral Latinx students and that we showcase their work. And so that to me is, is really incredibly important. And she was really committed to that, to that initiative. In the six, and I was actually, uh, I had the privilege and honor of working with her on that dissertation, outstanding dissertation competition committee from 2008 to 2014. We worked very closely during that period of time. And I have to say that during that time, she was the constant source of support. Uh, you know, she encouraged the committee members as we plowed through all of this, all of these dissertations and read you know, page after page after page and had to evaluate the work. And her presence, her kind words, her, her caring spirit really made this enormous task manageable. Uh, and you had to be there to appreciate her presence and what she did to support the work of that committee. So we were really blessed by her sound advice and her warmth. She was a very warm, warm person. Um, I, um, I also want to give you just a, you know, a few tidbits about her accomplishments to kind of show you her broad impact. Um, she received the national recognition for contributions and specifically, uh, she was actually named, uh, by, I think it's the diverse issues in higher education, if I'm not mistaken, she, she uh, was, was got, you know, recognized as one of the top influential women who made a difference in higher education. And that she received that award in, in 2012. And then 2017, she received the Circle of Achievement Education Award from the African American Chamber of Commerce in New Jersey. That's where I'm from. Uh, so in, in some, uh, you know, she, she did so much for ETS and she had an enormous impact in, in, her, in the local communities and also beyond. She was actively involved in lots of community initiatives like the Young Scholars Institute of, of Trenton in New Jersey, the National Urban Leagues Advisory Council on College Access and Success. I can go on and on and on uh, just to, to, you know, to tell you how much she did. But you know, let's just take a few moments and I wish we had a picture of her because she had this enormous magnetic smile. Um, but just imagine, just imagine her smiling on us right now. Lenora was an inspiration, a kind soul. She listened and found words, the right words to say when nobody else could say those words. So rest in peace, Lenora. I know you're looking down upon us right now and you're with us in spirit. You earned your wings. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Asara. We carry Lenora's legacy forward by honoring, continuing to honor outstanding scholars and leaders. And we will certainly continue to honor her legacy as long as he is around. All right, I'm gonna back up a little bit uh, because uh, we have a very, very special guest here who has just joined us. <laughs> I'm very, very pleased to, to welcome and, and in fact, uh, invite to come to the podium, our president for Nevada State College, Dr. Darion Pollard, who is our official host, our host with the most, but most importantly, she opened the doors of this institution to AHI, right? And that's anytime for those of us, you know, the way I was raised, I'll just say that, that, you know, when somebody opens the doors, right, to, your, to their home or their place of work, it's an honor. It really is. And it's our honor. We are truly honored to be uh, invited to this campus. The first time AHI has ever hosted a conference at an institution, right? And it's at Nevada State College. Please help me welcome President Pauly. So as Kamala Harris said, I may be the first, but I hope this is not the last time that Ahi will be at Nevada State College. Good morning and welcome. I 
I am so tremendously honored to be here this day, and I will be very brief because I know this program is not about me, uh, but I'm on a, a caffeine high. I was kind of pumping it in as I came in. I had a couple of days off this week, and I was doing something I think was very sacred, and I hope that it uh, translates in this space and place as well. I, I spent some time, uh, I, almost a year ago, uh, next month, I was the appointed president here and started a few months later. And that period from April to August uh, was frenetic as I moved across country and dealt with family grief and all the things that go with that. And then started a new job and trying to be fully present, right? And then interesting thing happened. I realized I had hit the wall. So I had a couple of friends who called me and said, let's take two or three days and let's just come together. And I was sharing with my colleague as we walked in, I said, it was tremendous the last few days. We, we laughed together, we cried together, uh, we networked and talked about our space and what's happening in higher ed in this nation. Uh, we drank entirely too much wine. Um, <laughs> I hiked though, that was fun. I found that's a new thing you do because we were just up in Phoenix. So I'm learning about what one does in this part of the, of the country. Uh, I got a couple of good walks in and we drank more wine. Um, so there's a theme here, right? So hence the caffeine today. Uh, but I will tell you what was sacred about that was the intentionality of like minds coming together. Uh, like minds coming together with a purpose and an intentionality around how they want to leave that space. So we knew coming together for those three or four days is that we knew we needed to get a little bit of soul food, if you will, if you will allow me to say that, and allow me to also share with you is that we treated that space as sacred. So I would invite you uh, as, as the servant leader of this institution to use your time here as sacred space. Uh, you're going to hear and have heard from uh, phenomenal speakers. Uh, you're going to have the opportunity to think big and large about what things are happening. But I encourage you, as we start to come out of this side of what has been a period of tremendous reckoning in our country around many different issues, that you treat this space you have here as sacred. And if there's anything that we can do to help you while you're here, um, I want to affirm that we stand ready to do that. I want to thank Victor for that very kind, very kind uh, introduction. But uh, I, he gave me credit for this. I had no credit. This was already happening before I got here. I just got to bless it when I walked in the door because I work for a college that believes in this type of work. And more importantly, I have a colleague and friend and one of my vice presidents who is a, a tremendous asset to this institution. Uh, but also a tremendous asset to our community. So I just want to give mad shout out to Dr. Edith Fernandez. Um, she's one of those ones, uh, Cornell West said of Bell Hooks, she is a friend of mine. Uh, I, I, there's a kindred spirit here and have uh, just latched on to her, uh, primarily because she has recognized and affirmed for me this vision that we have. And I'm going to end this. Why Nevada State exists? Uh, we exist to serve the new majority, and we are unabashedly and unapologetic in that. Um, your presence here is no mistake. And as you are walking the halls and talking and experiencing Nevada State, uh, and, and I'll make sure we send down some copies if you haven't already had this. I did my first 100 days and put a report out to the college community. And I issued five themes that came from that, what I heard. And the number one theme here was a clarification about our purpose. So I wanna leave you with this. While you are here experiencing Nevada State and experiencing this tremendous AHI conference, let me tell you about why we're here at Nevada State. And perhaps uh, you'll see some intersections about your presence and how you can take this back into your organizations. Nevada State was created with a profound purpose. The new majority are our students. First generation students, dreamers, adults with college credit but without college degrees, students of color, immigrants, and those maneuvering from poverty. We specialize in them and will design and continuously redesign around them. Our campus is designed with these students in mind. Nevada State exists to deliver high quality degrees for the new majority. We boldly define the new majority 
as first generation students, adult learners, students of color, dreamers, immigrants, and anyone looking for their opportunity to list themselves and their families out of poverty. I hope you can appreciate the redundancy there. Our purpose is to create and expand the new majority's participation in higher education, while at the same time, increasing income, mobility, and wealth for all Nevadans. We act with intention to design, redesign, and reinvent our campus as necessary to break down historic barriers that prevent learning. We do this by focusing on great teaching, transformative student experiences, empowering employees, and creating strategic alliances that advance our mission. Our new university will continue to be a community where anyone can belong. We will protect our people, our culture, and live out our values in the way that we work here. Nevada State University will make the audacious bet on the future of education in Nevada by Nevadans and for Nevadans and the responsibilities that come with this. We are bold, we are great, we are state. Welcome to Nevada State College. Thank you. How about a round of applause for Dr. Pollard? So uh, I, I don't know about you, but I want to come work here. I want to come work for you. <laughs> I think we all need to stay. So on behalf of our, our, our board and our membership, we, we present to Nevada State College as our inaugural host, this very, very modest token of our appreciation for hosting the I Hate Play Kids Conference. Thank you so much. I'm so also, Get a photo real quick. <laughs> All right, thank you, President Pollard and Dr. Fernandez. Thank you both. Be bold, be great, be safe. What a great slogan, that's awesome. All right. Okay. We've referenced, I've, I've mentioned this a few times now and them a few times and I wanted to very briefly acknowledge the 21-22 uh, AHI Fellows uh, the Graduate Fellows Program and the Faculty Fellows Program, uh, there, there are two legacy programs and, and they were why AHI was created, quite frankly. There are a number of you in the audience today that are alumni of both of these programs. Can I have first the alumni to please stand to be recognized of either the Graduate Fellows or the Faculty? Look at this, wow. Unbelievable. In uh, almost 20 years of programming, uh, every year, roughly 30 to 40 individuals across the country uh, are recognized as AHI fellows, either graduate or faculty fellows. This year is no different. We're going to learn and, and, and hear from all of our fellows later this afternoon. We're going to have a very special ceremony to honor and welcome them to our community and to our membership association. I do know that a few of this year's fellows are also in the audience, so please stand to be recognized, those of you who are here. Uh, 
So, bienvenidos, bienvenidos, felicidades to all of you. Enhorabuena uh, for being selected as a fellow for this year. It's a great legacy of of, of uh, alumni that that are part of each of these different programs, our, our legacy programs, and we're proud of them. And we also have, as I mentioned earlier, a great strategic partnership with the New Leaders Academy as well. And every year, uh, he sponsors, this year I believe it's eight or so, nine maybe, uh, individuals to a sort of partial scholarship to participate in this leadership development program. So many of you perhaps, are, or, or some of you have participated in the ACE Fellows or the Millennial Leaders Program or some, the Aspen Fellows, you name it. There's so many others. Haku's got one as well now, Academia de Liderazgo. Well, we have our own, and we're proud to have this amazing partnership with NLA and the University of Utah. Are there any NLA fellows here today to be recognized? Please stand to be recognized. All right. So I just want you to think about and visualize with me the, the pipeline of sorts that we have, literally from graduate school to early career scholars to our fellow faculty fellows to our leadership programs. The idea here is that AHI is your destination and your choice to seek out this additional mentoring and support and training and, and, and leadership um, competencies and whatnot. So this is a, the association for you. We wanna to continue to highlight this as a vehicle to help advance your careers because in turn, our community will be so advanced as well. So thank you all for being here, all of you who are fellows this year or in the recent past. Um, and we're not stopping there. And I don't, again, I won't give it all away we're working with our board members and our, and our members across the association to engage undergraduates as well in the next round as we continue to build out this, this pipeline. Uh, and yes, even high schoolers, right? We recognize that these are the challenges of representation of sort of building the pool, if you will, uh, is one that has to begin early and early on. And so with that, we're gonna continue to find creative ways to partner across the educational career pipeline. I'm so honored now to welcome to the podium two individuals who truly have made this conference possible. Our conference co-chairs, Dr. Nancy Acevedo and Dr. Hermen Diaz. As, we, as I bring them up, I'll just say, whenever we invite or, or really uh, cajole someone to be a conference chair, it's not an easy ask. Okay, it's not. I know it isn't. We're um, already so overcommitted, stretched, taxed, you name it, as people of color representing a diverse set of identities, right? And so when we ask, make this ask, it's always hard because we know it means it's unpaid. This is all service, all work, all love and passion work. It has to be, right? But Nancy did not hesitate. Hermen did not hesitate when they were asked. All right, and I just wanted to say that about both of these amazing individuals. They have led the charge with our conference planning committee the last year in preparation for us to be here with a lot of uncertainties, not knowing where we were gonna be, if we we're gonna be in person or not, hybrid, you name it. And instead we decided to throw everything at them to make it as complicated as possible. Please help me welcome for all they've done for our association, Nancy and Hermen. Thank you, Victor. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Nancy Acevedo, Associate Professor at California State University, San Bernardino, and I am so grateful to be here as the conference chair this year. Hi, everybody. Uh, Dr. Herman Diaz, Assistant Professor uh, in Higher Education Administration at SUNY Buffalo State College, pronouns he, him. And before we share a little bit more about the conference theme and how that came about. We wanna make sure we acknowledge all of the committee members um, who, were, who worked really hard with us. Uh, we met weekly for a few months for a couple hours of meeting and they uh, just agreed so graciously. And so um, they were so giving with their time and their energy and their thought process as we developed the theme. Yeah, so to, to recognize these uh, wonderful committee members and all the hard work that they've done throughout the past year, a uh, big thank you to Eddie Alvarez, Audrey Baca, Ramiro Batista, Alonzo Campos, 
Vincent Corrales, and Gabriela Chivada. And we had Marlene de la Cruz, Luis Jimenez Inoa, Ruth Lopez, Diego Luna, Jason Rivera, Rigoberto Marquez, Mayra Olivares Sueta, and James Rodriguez. And so in, in developing this conference committee a year, about a, yeah, a year ago, we asked for individuals to volunteer. Um, we went through the list of previous fellows and alumni of, of these programs that we have at AHI. Um, and for me, I've been involved with AHI since 2011 as a graduate fellow. And in that, in that experience, AHI felt like an academic home to me where it was this, this family that was developed very, uh, like we were immersed in that experience. So many members of our committee were also previous AHI faculty and graduate fellows who were ready to give back right, and reciprocate what AHI did contributes towards us as scholars and emerging scholars. Um, but everybody on the committee was critically conscious, um, asset-based mindsets, um, and then familiar with the efforts that we have at AHI to develop this sense of community um, that we strive to, to foster here. And so when we met first, we thought about last year's conference theme, which was Sembrando Semillas, Planting Seeds. And we thought about how do we move beyond envisioning what higher ed should be and towards taking action. And with this theme, we acknowledge the systemic obstacles that continue to exist, that have existed historically, that intersect with one another. But we aim to transform our institutions and to excavate and eliminate these barriers ultimately, right? But the committee centered justice-oriented work. And we reframed it with you know, these attacks on, on social justice that have happened nationwide. We wanted to center it. And we also wanted to acknowledge that this work is done with love, con amor. Um, so we were informed by and we build on the words of, of both Bell Hooks and Alicia Garza, where Hooks highlights that love will move us away from domination in all its forms. And Garza um, aims to transform grief, despair, and rage into the love that we need to push us forward. Right? And sometimes we don't, we don't often hear the word love in higher education. Um, but for us, just thinking of the, the conference, the AHI itself, we really wanted to center that. And we hope that through this conference and the theme that AHI um, serves as a space for querencia for all of us and beyond when we go back to our institution, a place where one feels safe, a place from which one's strength of character is drawn and where one feels home, right? Um, and our hope is that by striving for justice through amor and querencia, that higher education leaders, researchers, practitioners um, will enact policies and practices that move beyond coping with the injustices that we have to continue navigating and instead offer these different moments of healing for the Latinx, Latina, Latino communities um, within higher ed and outside of higher ed. So we're just so grateful for all of you who are present in person, for all of you who are present in Zoom, because we acknowledge that we've been in this pandemic for a couple years now. Um, we acknowledge there's burning out. We acknowledge that um, we all care deeply about the work that we do and the communities that we center. So we just wanna say thank you to everyone present and thank you so much to our committee members as well uh, for, for the work that has happened so far. Once again, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Armen. Uh, thank you doesn't even cut it. I know you've done and continue to do so much to get us here and to ensure that we've, they've delivered a fantastic two days together. And, and in fact, this year, we also had several pre-conference activities prior to uh, the conference starting through, through Zoom. So several of you I know were instrumental in helping to uh, showcase that in the last few months as we build momentum towards the conference. All right, so I'm doing a time check and uh, okay, as always, we're right on time. <laughs> All right, I'm being facetious, but we're gonna get, we're gonna get back on time here. Um, what, what we do now is uh, probably the longest standing activity that he has ever done. Um, I said earlier, we go back, our history goes back 40 years, almost 40 years. A big part of that is this uh, lecture series that was named after Tomas Rivera. The, the first ever uh, Latinx individual who uh, has led a UC campus. But beyond that, uh, Dr. Rivera's legacy carries on in, in so many individuals, scholars, leaders that were uh, impacted under that wide um, landscape right, of, of influence that he had throughout his career. 
So the Tomari Vera lecture this year, as every year, is done in partnership with ETS. And uh, I, I will be inviting Dr. Jamal Watson here to the podium. Let me just say a few things about Dr. Watson, if I may. Uh, Jamal and I go way back. I mean, every time there are convenings like this, anytime there are communities of color coming together to advance the cause of our respective communities, Jamal has always been there as a partner through his work at Diverse and now through his work with ETS. Um, I'm, I'm privileged to, to be able to call him our partner in his new role, leadership role at ETS. So without any further ado, let me invite and please help me welcome Dr. Jamal Watson to the stage. Thank you so much, Victor. Let's give Victor another round of applause if we can for all of his hard work in bringing us together. And I also wanna just briefly uh, thank you all for acknowledging Lenore Green. Uh, I was the top editor at Diverse Issues in Higher Education. I was minding my own business. And then Lenora called me and said uh, she was thinking about retiring soon and, and recruited me to ETS. And so only Lenora could do that. And I wanna say that the partnerships that she created um, they will continue with AHI, and not only will they continue, we will grow those partnerships moving forward. So on behalf of Dr. Walt McDonald, our president and CEO, I bring you greetings from the Educational Testing Service. We are proud of our longstanding partnership with AHI, and we are thrilled to see the growth of this organization. As I look around the room, I see so many of my friends and I'm heartened by the good work that you do. Uh, we also have some colleagues from ETS. Can you stand, raise your hand? Is Catherine here? There she is, Catherine Walt, and they are also here. And our mission at ETS is to advance quality, equity, and opportunity in education. So today's lecturer is also committed to those same goals. I had a chance to meet Professor uh, Cantu uh, last evening and was so excited because I had read so much about her and have studied her work. Uh, Professor Norma V. Cantu is a civil rights litigator who was lead or co-lead on cases such as Edgewood versus Texas Education Ag Agency and Gomez versus Illinois Board of Education. A first generation college student, she attended community college and graduated with a bachelor's degree from Pan American University. She started her first teaching job in Brownsville, Texas at the age of 19 and graduated from Harvard Law School at the age of 22. After a brief stint, go ahead, you can clap for that. <laughs> After a brief stint with the Texas Attorney General's Office, she worked 13 years for the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, MALDEF. She was nominated by President Bill Clinton and unanimously confirmed by the U.S. Senate as Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. She is the longest serving Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights in the U.S. Department of Education. From 2002 to present, she has been a full professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy at the University of Texas at Austin, where she also teaches at the law school. More recently, in addition to teaching, she has volunteered with the Biden-Harris Transition Team. She is chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, which will be celebrating its 65th anniversary as an independent bipartisan fact-finding federal agency. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our nation's social justice warrior. Please join me in welcoming Professor Norma V. Cantu. So don't use my career path, by the way. Uh, and I'm distance. Okay, we got it. Okay. Jamal, my screen froze. You can't fix that. Okay. 
So I'm so grateful. I'll start out with that. I'm grateful to see you all here in person because I was at that conference two years ago where we were trying to figure out, do you elbow somebody? Do you tap your ankle against them? Do you bow? Do you hit them in the face with your elbow while you're tapping your ankle and bowing? So how amazing is it that we're all here today, hybrid, online, and in person? I think it's fantastic. And we're doing this because so many people work so hard under leadership from, from Dr. Sines to create a safe place for Hispanic scholars. The, the theory, the idea behind this 38, 40 years ago was that Latino scholars felt excluded, they felt not respected, they felt left, left out and undervalued from the existing higher education organizations and felt a need to create their own space. And look at that, some of those organizations don't exist anymore, and here you are, you do. You are here, congratulations to you all. This organization, Aki, is open to Hispanics and others. We've provided an alternative place or setting for accelerating the advancement of Latinx scholars. By the way, I'll sometimes say Latinx and sometimes Hispanic, that's because I'm straddling generations here. It's an urgent cause for us to share our voices and it's an urgent cause for others to hear our voices. And I've returned many times to this safe place where I, I, I can see these scholars, these agents of change, these promoters of economic justice, these allies of vulnerable populations, these elected officials, foundation leaders, and others who have gathered together to work and discuss and plan the future together. You're taking a risk inviting me to speak to you because I've warned my colleagues, I've warned them, I do damage in a courtroom. I mean, hey, I warn people that my courtroom skills are really much better than my lecture skills. And in fact, <laughs> Dr. Angela Valenzuela actually showed that that was true one time because I gave a lecture, it was my job talk for goodness sakes, right? And I said, this new legislation called uh, uh, leave no child left behind. As soon as the election happened, they changed it to no child left behind like they'd finished the job. And I told the little girl sitting in the front row and I said, Remember that NCLB doesn't stand for No Child Left Behind. It stands for Norma Cantu Lectures Badly. <laughs> and the little girl, Angela's daughter, at the end of the lecture, I asked her, okay, tell me what NCLB stands for. And she said, Norma Cantu Lectures Badly. So I'm a good teacher, hey. <laughs> so you're taking this risk. You know I'm here because I love you all. I hope the love comes through. So for the record, the introduction that Victor gave was true, but he did things that he needed to do legally too, because lawyer advice. I am not here representing the federal government. I'm not their spokesperson. That's not the hat. By the way, my motto is the more hats you wear, the more shoes and purses you can buy. Okay. Come on, now, I made that up and you still like it, okay. <laughs> The things that Victor had to do was to say that, that I've been invited in a various number of capacities, not as a representative of the federal government. So my comments are my own. Oh, by now you figured that out. Um, and the USCCR is an independent bipartisan agency. It consists of eight commissioners, four are Democrats, three are Republican and one independent. The independent tends to vote mostly with the Republicans. So I work in a bipartisan arena now and and that and I'm still happy about it because they're they've they volunteered they were they were voluntold or volunteered but they're on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in the year I've been there as a commissioner I haven't been a year, there a year yet as a chair but in the year as a commissioner we've put out a re report on the racial implications of maternal health care we've gone to Houston and to San Juan Puerto Rico in person to look at the impact of Hurricane Maria and Harvey, and we've got a report that's coming out on that. We hold diverse views. We have different views of what, what we should be doing and what the future of civil rights looks like, but we're working together and talking together. And when we disagree, you'll hear about it because the news media is like holding a microphone right in front of them. But these diverse views, I'm not speaking about the commission and for, for the commission today. These meetings for me are like 
a family reunion. This is where awards given out, where people celebrate the transitions in their careers, where they, they serve as mentors and sources of progressive and creative ideas regarding, regarding the future of Hispanics. By the way, in the chat, if I'm talking too, too fast, I apologize, I'm Latina. Aki meetings are a continuous reminder that the work is not finished and that the merging of pathways of Latinx persons in higher ed with the pathways of other racial and ethnic groups is still an attainable goal and an urgent undertaking. So my first question, and by the way, I'm not gonna give you homework. I used to be an eighth grade teacher and I'm not here to represent you as a lawyer, but I'm gonna ask some questions. So what's the root? The, 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 the theme is cultivations. Everything I try to grow as a flower or a plant dies, I overlove it. I give it too much water, too much sunlight, too much fertilizer, a lot of fertilizer in Texas. And so, the, so here's the first question. What's the root, yeah, pun, of the problem of excluded Latinx students, scholars, and administrators in higher education? So for two decades now at the AHI meetings, numerous Hispanics and professionals, administrators, researchers, students have all voiced their objections to be excluded. Their feeling of, we don't, we don't feel like we belong. We're being told that we don't belong in the prestigious institutions. We're being told that you know, we're not going to advance as quickly as, as, as our family expects us to. And, I'm, and, and, and so what we've heard in the prior meetings our thoughtful presentations on every aspect of higher education, from preparation preschool all the way to higher ed, from financial aid, from equal access to STEM programs, an end to discrimination against the dreamer students, holler for the dreamer students, to name a few of our previous conferences. And, and just to hurt myself, patting myself on the back, I was a baby lawyer on Tyler versus Doe. So when I started at Maldiff, I was on the legal team and so one of these days, maybe I'll be the last surviving attorney, you know, with my little, oh no, by then I'll get a robot. I'm not gonna use a cane. By then I'm gonna get a robot. We heard and discussed reasonable, less discriminatory alternatives. No one can say that there aren't other ways of running higher education that would be, that they, they, they can't say, there's no excuses. They can't say why there aren't more of Latinx people as students and as faculty. So, what we've got is partners too, outside. That was internal, outside. We've partnered with sister organizations. Y'all have served on some of their boards. Y'all have volunteered for some of them. You know we've got friends. We're, we, we work at making friends. And so I'll name some of the folk I've been calling all the time. The, the Center for Law and Education, ASPEDA, Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights, Asian American Legal Defense Fund, NAACP, Excelencia in Education, HACU, LUTS, LAC, Thatches, there's so many, we've got friends. Yet, despite our best efforts to report out the tremendous gains in research about Latinos in higher ed, the opposition to full inclusion continues. So the root of the exclusion, I'm gonna say comes from that third branch of our, of our federal system, which is legislative, executive, and legal, that third branch, the courts. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm not telling you what to do, but I tell my students, when you become education leaders, the lawyers are there to show you how to do it legally, but you choose the destination and you choose the goal. So here is, as not your personal lawyer, but here I am, walk in the talk. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm showing you where, where, the legal, where the legal issues are. Okay, Latinos weren't considered a legally protected group by the constitution until 1954 in the same volume as Brown versus Board of Education. Hernandez v. Texas was a case where Latinos were excluded uh, from, from serving on juries in 40 years. They had a, not a single Spanish surname person serving on a jury in the county coming out of Texas. The Supreme Court said Latinos could not be denied access to serve on juries because the constitution protected this class of persons who had suffered a history of exclusion in employment, education, and other govern go governance areas. So the testimony from that was a PhD, a Latino named George I. Sanchez. Our education building is named after Dr. Sanchez. And he submitted our place in history as a group who had experienced this illegal discrimination. 
Um, when he came back, his, his department chair told him, why did you go testify? He said, sir, I got subpoenaed. And that's, that's something that we can all be very proud about, um, that, that we follow the law, we enforce the law, we don't break the law. We are, we are proud people. And when a subpoena comes in or a request comes in from the legislature to testify, we testify. When the request comes from the judge, it isn't a request, it's, it's, it's a, an order from the judicial. We weren't mentioned in Brown versus Board of Ed, but we were mentioned in Rodriguez. And Rodriguez was a federal case that was disastrous. It, 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 it gave the court an opportunity to say the same thing the court had said in Brown versus Board of Education about how important education was, how it was essential for us to enjoy all our other freedoms and all our other constitutional rights. How do you vote? How do you get a job? How do you, you know, be an American without getting an education? The court missed its opportunity completely and instead said, there's nothing in the four corners of the document that is our constitution that even mentions education. So it missed that opportunity to, 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 to make education a human right. And it, and it denied us. And they said, oh, oh, but please don't be worried because there's a state Supreme Court in California in the Serrano case, and you will find your rights protected there. The court ruled that there needed to be a quality of education the, the relief the court ordered was everybody needed to level their funding down to, no, to within $100 of the lowest spending school districts in California. So we were all equaled down to the cellar, to the basement, to the bottom of the valley. The Supreme Court hoped that, that the state courts would do the job that the Supreme Court didn't do. And Serrano resulted with a huge, huge surplus in the state budget. And none of that money was available for the, the kids in the Edgewood case or in the California and the Serrano case. So I'm bumming you out. I'm going to continue to do it for a little bit. <laughs> I, I, on the other, I'm going to do it another way. In the, in the Rodriguez case, there was a tiny little footnote, which lawyers love to read, but so do you folk working in graduate. And the footnote said, but this is not a case about the absolute total exclusion from education. It's just about different levels or degrees of quality of education. And everybody thought, it doesn't mean anything. Why would anybody ever totally exclude kids from public education? Home state of Texas raised its hand and said, we're going to do it to the undocumented children. The state of Texas said they're going to get charged out of state tuition. They're going to get charged out of state tuition, knowing full well that doing that would totally prevent students whose parents were undocumented. They actually nailed it. They fit the definition in the footnote of the kind of court case that the Supreme Court would say, yeah, we'll look at that. Yeah, that's totally different from, it, from the Edgewood case, the Rodriguez case. So in Plyler, the children's circumstances were really dire. I mean, these, these are kids who didn't choose to come to the United States. They got brought in as little kids by their parents. This is one where if you had a younger brother and sister who was born here, they were in school and you're not. This is a situation where the jobs that the parents came to find in the US were, were, were not easy jobs. It's not easy to come to the US and get a job. They were in Tyler, Texas, where the main agricultural crop is Texans. Roses. Y'all just hand it out. You, I, I almost said, oh, it's a rose theme today. The long stem roses that you hand out to your lover, you, you give your beloved roses. The, pan, the people who went into the fields and cut those roses, that went through the thorns and brought those roses back in as their harvest, they cultivated the roses. Their children could not attend school. Not an easy job at all. The children testified in court. They said under oath, they want to go to school. And they meant it. And a majority of the court agreed with the parents and, and, and the lawyers who argued the case, including uh, Peter Roos from Olive. And that led to an outpouring of love and affection by happy parents who filled the waiting room of the local attorney with long stem Tyler Roses to show their joy at having the children of the Thorns be awarded their places in the schools. When I say that to, to elementary school children, they write me thank you notes and they draw a kind of a big lady, and they surround me with roses. I look like the Virgen de Guadalupe. It's actually really good. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> See, aren't you glad you came today?
Hey, come on. <laughs> and I'm on question two now. How widespread are the issues affecting Hispanics in the, in the area of higher education? The root undergirding the, the fight for, for equality has continued to produce a real sturdy structure in the lawsuit called Adams versus Bell. You all haven't heard of Adams versus Bell because that's one where the LDF, the African-American community took the leadership because when, when the, the newly created US Department of Education started making a list of all the projects they were, gonna, they were gonna work on, the US Department of Education said, we don't do civil rights and stopped all work involving race. In fact, they tried to erase race from, from any document they produced. That's not what we're here for. And just to shut down, what, what was wrong with that was in several Southern states, the Department of Justice and, and investigators at the Department of Education were trying to desegregate higher education all across the South, all the way to Miami, but not Texas. They had not opened investigations. A couple of years later, they started opening investigations and talked to Texas and Texas can charm you. They can tell you stories, they can make you laugh. So Texas investigation was like pending. All the other states had already been referred to the Department of Justice or had settled. And Texas was kind of like hanging out there going, ha ha, we're, we're, we're fine, right? Well, the Malta folk, you know, I'm still a baby lawyer. The Malta folk called me and said, we need to show up in court. You need to find some clients, which you can do if you're a nonprofit. Find some clients, tell them show up in the, in the, in the case brought by the African-Americans in Adams versus Bell. I walk in there, I'm not even a member of that court. I get permission to, to be able to show just for this appearance. And I say, this is the single most important topic regarding Hispanics in the country. If you're going to make decisions about entire states, we need to be allowed to intervene. The judge said, yes. And then I made my argument. The judge said, I'll take it under advisement. Everybody else left and the bailiff put his hand up and said, stop. The judge wants to talk to you. So I thought, shh. <laughs> the judge had a sister who was a nun, his sister, the sister. She was a teacher in Houston. And he was sure that I had run into her somehow. <laughs> and because he was a military veteran and he no longer had his right hand, he shook me with his left hand and said, be well. And we won the motion. We were allowed to intervene. It put us at the same footing as all the other Southern states. And we were able to, to, to get a settlement, which Texas never followed. But hey, we showed up on the national higher education uh, arena on the stage for the first time. And that, and that was important. What that lawsuit did, that intervention did, is it put all of the state institutions of higher education on the same expectation of submitting annual data reports. So we found out how far behind we were in, in Latino hires, how far we behind we were in student completion rates, how far behind we were in admissions. All of those issues were just as plain as a nose on your face on black and white on a piece of paper. No judge could say, I never saw that. It was right there. So we started something and, and baby lawyers do things. Huh? Okay. So the branch is also included the, the, the higher ed version of the Dolby Plyler case like Letitia A. And Peter Roos ran with that one. He was able to persuade California systems of education, work this out, let's, let's make this happen. And one by one, other states, you know, looked at it, said, that's nice, you're California, you can do that. Surprisingly enough, a Latina, Irma Rangel, was able to negotiate with the Texas legislature. And Texas was the first state to voluntarily allow kids who were dreamers, the children of the plotters, come to school. You did well in high school, you'll do well here in our campuses. More than half the states voluntarily now enroll the dreamer kids. But that's not enough. That's not enough. So the late Irma Rangel, and God, God, may she rest in peace and power, we're still working on that. We've suffered a setback in state court when we did the uh, state lawsuit on higher education finance. Uh, a fourth of the, of, the, of the university, but only 10% but only, uh, uh, of the funds. Um, that we thought was an excellent case. We, Al Kaufman had won the public school finance. He, he, was, he was team leader on filing the higher ed finance. We did win a district court. The Supreme Court reversed itself on some prior uh, rulings that they'd made about funding. We lost because, hey, if the court just changes its mind, you lose. But we didn't lose. 
because people like Irma Rangel and others at the state legislature put it in a bill that this, this, this looks very likely to be successful at the Supreme Court, work something out so that you could give to the lawyers to show that you're serious about that funding imbalance. And what they put in there was $660 million. How many of you can lose a case and your clients are $660 million ahead? Al Kaufman can, he can do that for the Latinos. And what it meant for, for the border area is they caught up on engineering schools. They're, they're, they're catching up on medical schools. They, they, the campus in Laredo, and I love Laredo, Dr. Cigarroa's uh, father was a witness. He testified that they didn't even have a campus and that when they taught their college kids, they taught about the high school buildings. How sad to finish high school and come back as a college student in the same room where you were in high school. And they have a gorgeous building and they have a, a medical annex. So the, they're halfway to a medical school there. These are the lawyers telling you what's going on. So third question, why do you need to plant new seeds you know, to expand higher education? Well, I had to look up things about, you know, about, about what it means to, to do to plant seeds. And when you plant a seed, you take a chance because that seed can, can mutate and form something totally different than the plant it came from. But what we've been doing in this country in a lot of places is we've been doing cultivars. You know, the first part of cultivate and then they, it's, it's a thing, okay? Well, that, what that thing is, it's actually kind of violent because the gardener takes a knife cuts off a piece of a living plant or tree, removes it from the mother tree, and then grafts it onto a totally different tree because the gardener wants exactly the same thing to happen that has always happened. So you have an orange tree and you really like the way the leaves are and you like the size of the oranges and the taste of the oranges. From here on in, that orange tree is all you'll grow. That's the only thing because you have the cultivar attitude toward higher education. You're a gardener like every other gardener, but your expectation and everything you're putting, all your energy, all your time is just repeating the same thing over and over and over again. When you plant seeds, semillas, like you discussed at the last one, you're taking a chance at something better, more beautiful, sweeter, and you're putting more love into it because it surprises you. With the cultivar, there are no surprises. It's easy work. You could be a an edu a higher education administrator if everyone's a cultivar because they look like the last class you admitted and your next class is gonna look like that class you admitted. Right, you're nodding, oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I, I, I've never used that one before. You're my, you're my beta group and, and this is good. You're gonna steal this one, right? I know you're gonna steal, yeah. <laughs> Te conozco, okay. So ahi members are part of our seeds. The, 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 the young folk that, that you're coaching are part of our seeds. We don't expect anyone who's a fellow or anyone who's been at these conferences to come out just like we are. In fact, I'm telling you, you need to be half my size, okay? So don't be just like me. Hey, by the way, break so I can rag on myself because I have to do that every 10 seconds or my blood sugar goes down. Um, I joined a group of women to run marathons. This was back when I was in DC. Everybody weighed over 250 pounds. There were 20 of us and all 20 of us finished the marathon. Okay, so how did we do that? We did that by looking out for each other and asking each other, or how do you feel? How are your knees? One of them said, I can't look down at my watch. I can't pace. I said, no problem. I'll sing for you. I am a terrible singer. Ask any of my nieces and nephews. They will say, Norma, stop. It's like in Forrest Gump where the whole crowd holds up the sign that says, stop. But I sang to them and they all finished the marathon. We walked super fast because we, we thought if we were actually running, we'd fall down, but we finished those marathons. And so I want to tell you folk that these new members are simious. All of us, all of us are going to be are uniquely who we are. And by the way, I did early on, I showed my dad a trophy that I won because it was a training race, it was only 5K. He said, where'd you buy that? <laughs> this is my daddy who loves it. Where'd you buy that? Okay. So with this concept of new seeds, Dr. Oliva invited me to serve on the national board. This was a long, long time ago. And he did a phenomenal job. 
and he passed the baton and you all are doing a phenomenal job and you're not a cultivar. You are new, you are unique. And this focus on the, the Briggy Ginn folk of all ages, that's, that's part of the diversity and the strength. Fourth question, how are the effects of exclusion or lack of support being measured? And, and don't be afraid of when I say measurement because I'm not suing you guys. I mean, I've sued everybody, but you know, okay. The court cases show a pattern of different treatment of how Latinx students are assessed. For example, in Gomez versus Illinois State Department of Education, the evidence showed an unusual number of school districts consistently found only 19 students in their grade levels whose home language was Spanish. Now that number was interesting because 19 was suspect because the state law had a threshold of 20 for the requirement of special language support for, for growth and development of the English language. So that, that if the law requires at 20, you have to do something and everybody was finding 19, Mira, okay? The state blamed the school districts for the undercount of English language learners and the school districts blamed the state education agency. The trial court agreed with both of them and said, well, you're out of court because I can't figure out who did what. I argued the appeal, the Seventh Circuit ruled that both the districts and the state should have been measuring the needs of the students, both of them, and sent back the case for trial. Both states and districts settled out of court. So because I tolerate diversity, I'll give you the other side of that argument. I got there and the middle judge of the three judge court was asleep. I didn't take it personally because he was asleep when I got there. But all my Latino and Latina friends said, you could have woken him up. Uh, no, 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 you don't wake up a federal judge from a nap. That's just stuck. Uh, no, 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 no. We, all three judges voted for the Latino kids. Assessment matters. Assessment is something that the federal court expects equal treatment, equal protection. In Texas, there, the, the state had been sued because in the Castaneda case, kids were being assessed for placement in, in uh, accelerated programs and they were only being assessed in English. So if you were Spanish speaking, you failed the test, you never got into an advanced kind of class. The Fifth Circuit, out of their own beautiful brains, came up with the first interpretation of the country and said, it's a three-part test. You've, you've, got to, you've got to assess them in a language they understand. You have to provide resources if they don't, if they don't perform well, and you've got to keep reopening the, 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 the opportunities. They had earlier come up with a three-part test for English language learners, was, which was, it has to be scientific. It has to be vouched for, it being the, the program for, for giving students support in, 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 uh, because of their language, uh, being English language learners. It has to, that, that their program has to be vouched for by experts, plural. So not one person could raise their hand and say, this is the program I'm gonna sell you. It has to be fully implemented, which means trained teachers, full curriculum, books, everything. I can't tell you how many libraries I've gone in and I can't find the Spanish language books for readers. I just can't find them. Uh, and then the third part is it has to be periodically reassessed and replaced if it's not effective. These judges had never had a case like this before. They, they had a team of legal aid lawyers come in and bring this, these issues to them. And the judges ruled correctly that you don't test kids in the wrong language. Imagine if you had to take a, a driver's license test in, in Ukraine and you had, to, you had to know one of their languages to pass the driver's license test. That's how we were treating kids. Texas, being a little bit, little bit clever, said the court said, if you're going to test them, so why don't we just give a blanket exemption? No English language learners get tested. And they were stealing a, a note from a California case where African-Americans were complaining about harm from the IQ tests. So they wouldn't give IQ tests to black people. That's fine, it's easy. Just don't let them get the information because they might use the information for something. So they took the information away for several years. The, the Maldives suit was, was dismissed because the court said they, they did fix it. They did decide to start including those kids and that's why the graduation tests are a little off center because there were some years that were gap years. That's that. In the school, the legislature, by the way, there were people in the legislature who said that's wrong. The Texas legislature said you can never use a standardized test as the sole criterion for admission to college or for higher education placements. So that made a lot of sense. That made a lot of sense. For the ETS people, it means I don't get to sue you because the Texas people have already been told do the right thing. 
And, and although that has happened, I've served on committees and I've heard people say, oh, look, look, we have financial aid money. Let's distribute it on merit. Let's just solely rely on the GRE. And I reminded them state law and they said, oh, well, we'll ask ETS or someone if they will do validation for it. And, they, and I said, I've already gone to the website. The website says they'll do it if you pay for it. They said, never mind. <laughs> Because the money that's going to be spent for that validation would have come out of the scholarship program and then there wouldn't have been a scholarship program. So now scholarship programs are still open to everyone and you can, continue, you can consider a standardized test as one of many factors because you're looking at the whole student, not just one identifier, I'm almost done. So my colleague suggested that, um, I drop a couple of things out. How am I on time? Who's gonna say Norma stop? <laughs> Five minutes, let's see, last question. So, do, do the answers to the four questions make you as a lawyer feel that there's a likelihood of success because of all of the efforts that we've all put in? Yes, absolutely yes. The first time I heard the word querencia was from Dr. Cigarroa, who's a, a medical doctor, former chancellor of the UT system. He spoke here at Aki, not here, Austin here or Texas here, where was it? San Antonio here? San Antonio here. He spoke of querencia. I wanna be accurate sometimes. The, the, he spoke of querencia as, as a special place that you're drawn to, a place where your heart is. And I love that word. But Tomas Rivera had, had also talked about being attracted to a place and being drawn to places. In, a, in, in his poetic work, The Searchers, he talked about places that attracted him and places that repelled him. He, he talked about, um, his, one of the scholars that looked at, at, at his writings was Dr. Rolando Hinojosa. And he said, Dr. Rivera was looking for ways to control his anger. Isn't it great? Isn't it great that somebody who's not a lawyer could say things like that? I mean, lawyers can't say, oh yes, she was obviously looking for ways to control her anger. But, but, but you know, sociologists can do that. And in, and his, and in the poetry, he was looking for ways to heal that anger. And so he was searching. What he was searching for was social justice. And he offered this example from one of the poems, Vibora del Mar. Vibora is snake, del mar is sea, the sea snake. And Vibora, Vibora de la Mar, it's, it's, it's a children's game. It's, it's similar to London Bridge is, is falling down. It's similar to the musical chairs. Some of the kids are gonna go through the gauntlet and some of the kids are gonna get shut out. In the poem Vibora del Mar, the, the, game, the game is one where kids hold their hands up, drawbridge down, and you're captured. The poetry suggests that he's repelled by the sea snake in the game. And he also rejects the notion because the first lines are, unos corren mucho y los detrás se quedarán. The kids in the front will be able to go far. The kids in the back of that sea serpent snake, that serpent from the sea, are doomed to remain indefinitely in the back. I would reject that notion as a lawyer. You should reject that notion just as a person, just like the Navy SEALs and the Marines and now the Ukrainian soldiers and the civilians. Every effort should be made to leave no one behind. So these, these, these writings of Dr. Rivera, where he talks about looking for the library. He talks about in one of his poems of going to the city dump to find books. I remember I was a second grader. I would go through the, through the, through the, the bins, you know, the dumpsters for paper to write on because there was no paper in my house. So he was describing people who wanted to read just like the little kids in the Piler case who wanted to go to school. I see the love of learning in the eyes of everyone I know especially in the eyes of our students. Learning to read is a human right. Math is a human right. Knowledge of history is a human right. Learning to learn, learning to lead is a human right. Love of poetry and excellent literature is a human right. Art is a human right. Students should have a safe place where they can learn each of these skills without feeling that their learning is taking away learning opportunities from other students. Last paragraph. Governor George W. Bush once said, educators just need to build a bigger pie. Okay, make the pie higher, he said. 
He was right. The places for learning should not be restricted to a tiny part of the US population. The goal of the squid game for one survivor to finish, that's not our goal. That's no one's goal. We have, we have funding that needs to reach everyone. President Johnson signed it in 64. It, the federal government provides funds, the state provides funds, the local districts. I've seen many places, gone to many places. I'm very worried about online learning. I'm concerned about the digital divide, but I'm going to say that the future is where the private universities and the public universities work together and they're gonna support Latinx students in spectacular ways. The future is we're gonna encourage you to make education on the internet accessible to both public and private students and, and their parents and their grandparents because we're multi-generational. The, 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 the disability community says, don't talk policy about us, nothing about us without us. We're gonna say the same thing about Latinos. And the, the traditional scholars who argue that Latino Latinx students don't belong in the highest, most challenging and respected institutions. They are not only wrong, they're ignoring reality. We do want to avoid repeating the errors of prior leaders who want to treat us unfairly. We do want to mean, to mean that this doesn't mean quotas. We're not playing favoritism. What we do want to become the type of education leaders that all our students and faculties deserve. deserve. If someone says they don't know how because they never had a mentor, hey, a lot of us in this room didn't have a mentor, but we believe que si se puede. So I am so proud of you. Our symbol, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. You're gonna pick a new symbol. I'm gonna, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna take that out. We're all committed to high quality education. It's gonna secure the opportunities for us as Americans. We believe in opportunities for all. We're all American families. We stand together uninvited. That's what we do. Thank you and God bless you and your families. Thank you, Norma. I think it's safe to say that Norma Cantu is a national treasure. Really. And she's ours. Born and raised in deep South Texas, in, in El Valle de Rio Grande, La Tierra Sagrada. If you know, you know. All right, anyway. So I, I, I just, I thought it was important, and Norma, I know you sat down, um, but uh, to offer just two or three minutes of uh, opportunity for some questions. I didn't mean for you to go all the way, I'm so sorry. But I don't know, did y'all catch that she was part of the litigating team for Plyler v. Doe? Did y'all hear that? I mean, you know, I don't know what else I could say about that. <laughs> She's a big deal, y'all. Plyler v. Doe. There's no, no more determinative case, determinative case than there is than Plyler v. Doe for, for the bilingual communities in this country. So let me ask and invite a couple of questions, not just about Plyler v. Doe, but about the myriad of other cases. She's not kidding when she says she sued just about everybody worth suing, and then some. <laughs> Um, but uh, including the state of Texas, including her current employer, right? Talk about the courage. Adams versus Doe. Well, come on over here. I sued the Secretary of Education then. So when they wanted to hire me as part of the education, they wanted to know if I had gotten that out of my system. <laughs> How many of you have had job interviews like that? I doubt any of you have had job interviews like that. Yay. <laughs> Questions for 
How do we use research that are provided by, by current scholars and student scholars in the, in the courts? We use them in the courts, we use them in testimony before Congress, we use them in testimony before the US Commission on Civil Rights. That information, because when, when Congress has hearings, they have an open period for the public record to be supplemented. And, and the same thing with our US Commission. So, so that's one way that, that we use that. Also, some organizations um, file amicus briefs, which are friends of the court, amigo, you know, obviously, amicus briefs. When Al Coffin did Texas School Finance, he asked his teacher friends. The high school kids wrote in longhand why they wanted their schools to be fairly funded. The middle school printed. The elementary kids drew pictures. We love our school. Please help our school. Love, Linda. And they, they didn't follow the size thing, so those briefs, filed by the, by the kindergartners were always on the top of the pile. It was the first thing every justice in Texas had to see. It's cute, sweet, huh? Yes. Ah. Yeah. su nombre? Your name? Thank you, thank you. Yes. Hey, you know, Robert, thank you for, uh, for your talk. And I reflect on what you said, and I am uh, just touched because I'm a Cuban immigrant, and I was DACA before DACA. Mm -hmm. I came here at the age of three, and my parents lived in South Louisiana. And I never thought about what my parents had to do. They couldn't speak English. So they get me into the public school room. Yeah. Yeah. And the work that you do that reminds me of the responsibility that I have for DACA students who come to this country for a better future. Yeah. And I want you to elaborate a little bit more on the current challenges that we face as Latino scholars. Now that I've got my degrees and now I'm a, I'm a faculty member in the state of Texas, uh, our current lieutenant governor uh, is making some really challenging claims about what faculty who work in this area uh, are being threatened with tenure, being threatened with uh, academic freedom. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about how we, if we're going to continue doing this work that you would do, are perhaps being censored by yeah. our government? Well, there are organizations that represent uh, the American Association of University Professors. Uh, you can report things uh, to, to uh, various organizations that are civil rights oriented. Um, it used to be legal aid lawyers could do these kind of civil cases, but during the Reagan era, they, they took that power away from legal aid. The, the, the advice I give my students is your parents, you and I have invested a lot of time and money in getting you that PhD. And we don't want you to do something that's gonna cause you to lose it. So the best thing you could do is talk to organizations or even create organizations and have them be the lead in terms of if it's if it's going to be litigation, try to avoid it, try to resolve it by testifying first. Give them ample notice of ways to avoid the discrimination. But there are people who will who will be the front for you, who will bear that flag for you. Um, you also you also know it's illegal for them to to breach our academic freedom. You know, as faculty, you choose you know how you teach. The civil rights laws apply to whites and blacks and browns and all colors alike, which means you can't discriminate against your students because of their race. You can't do that. But when you're what 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 folk are trying to pa pack into that into that protection is if you make someone uncomfortable. Listen, I, I was at OCR for eight years, so I know what OCR does. The Office for Civil Rights. Being comfortable is not a civil right. Okay, it wasn't on the list. In order for someone to win a racial harassment case, they have to show that the action was because of race, so it has to show intent. They have to show that it caused you educational harm. You had to drop out because the, that's an example of what you have to show. So someone coming in and saying, I feel uncomfortable is not reaching a legal standard. And if you find your own lawyer, you can describe your own facts and you can do that. I, 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 Victor, can I talk about that I counsel someone? If you're teaching on Zoom, put that record button on. If you have students in your class who are, who are creating a, a racially charged uh, atmosphere, 
you'll have a recording that, that you weren't leading that discussion that way. The student was pushing the discussion that way. And then the last thing is you have colleagues, you know, you all formed a, a cohort here. You think you're gonna be in a situation where someone's gonna put you down. There's gonna be another friend of yours standing there with you. You're either recording it with a phone. It depends on your state. In Texas, you can record with your phone all the time. So in Texas, you have to mean what you say and say what you mean. But in other states, it's illegal to record someone without their consent. So that's why having extra people in the room is, is, a, is a practice tip. Yeah? We're running, sorry. Yeah. We're running a little short, hold on, hold on. Oh. We're running a little short on time, but uh, we do. Talk, by the way. Did you know that? I'm not, no, no. <laughs> I just do what you tell me to do, Norma, you know that. Um, I, I do wanna share something from Zoom. There's a comment that I thought would be important for you to hear from Yolanda Leva. Thank you, Yolanda. Mm -hmm. It's not a question, but a comment. She said, uh, muy estimada profesora Cantu, your talk was so powerful. When you said, quote, knowledge of history is a human right, it brought tears to my eyes. Because of your work, my university has a PhD program in borderlands history. And I have the privilege to teach them. I am forever grateful. So thank you, Yolanda. I just wanted to share that thank with you. you. Norma Cantu, everybody. Unbelievable. Wow. She, in the, in the 38 years we've given this lecture, she is the only individual to have delivered this lecture twice also, by the way. So thank you, Norma. All right, we're gonna shift gears. I know it's almost time for break and I will ask you to indulge me. We do have coffee back there and it'll be time to some catch up, but, but we do have uh, one important business to do uh, prior to doing that. I left my notes over here. <laughs> we, have, we have some really important uh, acknowledgements to make. Um, and awards to give out. And we start with this group of awards, again, in partnership with ETS. The Outstanding Dissertation Competition Award Ceremony is an annual tradition and, and really a privilege for us to be able to learn from these outstanding scholars. And this year is no different. I will invite uh, back to, to the podium, Dr. Jamal Watson and also uh, Dr. David Garcia from Arizona State University as chair of the Outstanding Dissertation Award Committee. Uh, and as we do that, uh, if uh, our three recipients this year, we do have three finalists, I'm sorry, two finalists and, a, and an actual award winner. Um, the, uh, the third place award winner, Dr. Elena Seda, is Elena here? Can you come up to the stage, Elena? Thank you. Second place award winner is Dr. Julio Cesar. Is Julio here? Julio, come on down as well. And then finally, the first place award winner, Dr. Nora Rivera. Come on down as well. So I'm gonna, I know it's kind of crowded. It gets a little crowded up here, but I wanted our three uh, honorees to be out here so that we can all see them as we uh, introduce and, and offer them an award, but to help share a little bit more about the, uh, the awards competition, let me invite Dr. Garcia to say a few words. Dr. Garcia. Victor, thank you. All right, this is a tough spot to be in because I can smell coffee back there. I know everybody's a little hungry, um, but uh, you know, I'm gonna do my best because we're gonna take a second and introduce uh, some amazing scholars this morning. My job as the privileged chair of the Outstanding Dissertation Competition is to have you understand what it took to get here, what it took the time and the energy and the commitment of the people who made this happen. And there was a many, many people who did that. But there's one other thing that I have to recognize uh, that I didn't, wasn't prepared to say this morning, but it, it came to me. And that's because Nancy had mentioned love. And it takes love for something like the Outstanding Dissertation Competition to last as long as it has. It takes love for Ahi. Somebody loves Ahi enough to keep it going so that it lasts 40 years. And for those of you scholars out there who are writing, the next time you get in front of your computer, understand that it takes love to keep the motivation and the commitment to your work as well. 
Believe it or not, when you're reading it, you can tell on the other side when somebody has put love into what they do and to what they write. And there's somebody else who loved this competition uh, tremendously. I, I, I was taken aback because I learned for the first time that she had passed away. And that is, that is uh, Lenora Green, who from the moment that I met her being recruited to be part of this committee, I knew and felt that she loved the outstanding dissertation competition. And I say that because we recognize scholarship and our community and the Latinx community and emerging scholars who go on to do great things and amplify their work and their influence to many of you sitting out here today. And it starts with the love of a, of, of a few people that can, and it did with Lenora. And so um, I wanna just let uh, ETS know my condolences um, for her passing. And I look forward to her continued legacy with the program and with AHI. Somebody else who loves this very much is Dr. Luis Olivas, who uh, be under his leadership, many of these programs um, were made possible. Dr. O was very big on legacy and having people understand those who came before uh, us. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take a second and recognize Dr. Olivas, Dr. Owen for his contributions to the outstanding dissertation competition. I need to thank ETS for their commitment to uh, the outstanding dissertation competition, but more specifically what they're committing to is to each one of you and to our scholarship and to recognizing emerging Latinx scholars. This is an important recognition professionally because like you heard the history of Ahi, the thought was that if people aren't going to recognize, the broader communities aren't gonna recognize our contributions, then we need to step up and do that ourselves. And that was made possible through ETS and their commitment to diversity and equity. So thank you very much everybody at ETS for your contributions. And then last, I don't know if we're gonna get their names up here, but our committee, our outstanding dissertation committee, um, everybody who contributed to, to making this happen. The, I wanna have you understand what it took for this committee to do this. We read about a thousand pages of uh, scholarship, which is a lot. And for those of you, and I, when I was doing my dissertation, I was told that nobody's gonna read it. I think that's to keep you, I think that's to keep you humble. But for everybody here uh, who, who has recognized, know that we read every page. We did. And we also had the joy, and it is joyful, to sit and discuss the merits of the scholarship, the methodology, the theoretical frameworks, the findings, the contribution. And I want to thank Nelson Flores, Jason Casillas, Mar Maricela Oliva, and Leticia Bustillos for their time, at, tons of time, in making this possible. So thank you very much to our committee uh, for their contributions. Thank you. And so from those thousands of pages and many, many um, submissions to the competition, the difficult task of choosing winners is something that's, that's always hard every single year. Uh, but as in every year, this, there are certain scholarships that, that stands out uh, for a number of reasons. And I am privileged to introduce our award winners today. Starting off with our third place award winner, Dr. Elena uh, Sada, whose dissertation on a narrative analysis on Latino male youth identity and self-advocacy in connection to career preparation uh, was something that, we, that stood out to us. So Dr. Sada, congratulations to you, congratulations. Congratulations. On the theme of testing and love, our second place winner is uh, Dr. Julio Cesar and his dissertation on standardized bilingual assessments, a means to reduce construct irrelevant variance and ethnic racial stereotype threat. I say it's on testing because this is a testing related topic, ETS, um, something for important for you and love because this is a quantitative dissertation, which is in my field and I greatly appreciate it. So Julio, congratulations for your work. Congratulations.
Before I announce the first place winner, I want to remind everybody, all three award winners will be doing a presentation of their doctor, uh, their dissertation tomorrow. So please, as part of the concurrent sessions, be sure to visit uh, with them uh, to see and to hear about their work firsthand. Our first place winner is Dr. Nora Rivera. And I have to admit, when I first picked up her dissertation, I didn't think it had relevancy. And then as I began to, to, to read it, um, I was taken aback uh, by the content and by the contributions, and you should hear, she should, I'll let her talk about it tomorrow, but about the importance of the, of the topic um, was something that opened my eyes, and I think it did the same for the, for the committee as well. Her work, uh, The Rhetorical Mediator, Understanding Agency in Indigenous Translation Interpretation Through Indigenous um, what is Approaches to UX Research, um, it was something that uh, for us um, really stood out. And so I wanna congratulate uh, Dr. Rivera for your work and contributions. Congratulations, you are a first place winner for the Outstanding Dissertation Competition. Thank you. One more round of applause for our three award winners. The Outstanding Dissertation Award. Once again, thank you, David. By the way, David ran for governor of the state of Arizona, the great state of Arizona. There you go. Uh, we have a pretty amazing uh, eclectic group of members here within AHI. And he's been chairing this committee now for the last several years. So thank you to him and to all the review committee. All right, as David mentioned, we're also gonna hear from each of our award winners throughout our conference at, at special featured sessions. Uh, you can find them in your programs. Uh, I do hope you get that opportunity to learn more and ask some great questions from these outstanding scholars. All right, I think we're about that time for a break, y'all. Uh, we got a half an hour too, so it's plenty of time to catch up, to build some more fellowship. We're gonna start back up at 10.45 a.m. sharp. There's coffee back there, the facilities are outside. And I believe there's also some snacks back there, if I'm not mistaken. You got 30-minute break. <laughs> <laughs>